Thank you for joining us for our webinar tonight about Adlai Stevenson II, the man from Libertyville. We're very excited to have Nicole Stocker with us. Uh, Nicole is a museum educator with the Dunn Museum, um, which is part of the Lake County Forest Preserve. Um, she teaches programs for children and adults. She also develops, um, she develops programs for both, both the museum and at the Adlai Stevenson Historical Home. Um, Nicole has been with us before. She's taught programs for us for both adults and kids, so she might be a familiar face to you. So uh, welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much, Raz. Um, and welcome everyone to the program and to Stevenson's house. So we will um, talk more about the space and some of the objects behind me a little later on, but I am broadcasting to you from Stevenson's study in the home. Um, and that is located near Libertyville in Metawa today. Um, so we uh, have a couple things we'll share with you today. I have um, PowerPoint slides so you can see some images and we're gonna talk a lot about his life and career um, before I share some of these, these items behind me. But I do work for the Dunn Museum and the Lake County Forest Preserves. And if you weren't aware before, the Adelaide Stevenson House is part of the Lake County Forest Preserves. And the Dunn Museum staff does help to um, interpret several historic sites within the forest preserves. So you might see me um, with programs related to this site as well as some others like Fort Sheridan or Bonner Heritage Farm in Lindenhurst, um, which I did a program with uh, Roz for previously. But tonight we are going to be talking about Adelaide Stevenson. And he um, is a very important and influential figure in the political history of the United States. So hopefully today through this presentation and program, you'll come to better understand this extraordinary man um, and his life ideals and personality. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. All right. So here you can see a view of the house itself, and we'll talk a little more about some of the architecture and things later on too. The picture shown here was taken on the property and featured as a cover of Life magazine the year that he died, 1965. And the quote that you see was made by Stevenson, and I think sums up his ideology about life very well. He says, quote, the goal of life is more than material advance. It is now and through all eternity, the triumph of spirit over matter, of love and liberty over force and violence. Adelaide Stevenson II was born in Los Angeles on February 5th, 1900 into an already very famous Illinois political family. His maternal great-grandfather, Jesse Fell, was a close friend and advisor to Abraham Lincoln. Fell actually prompted Lincoln to write a short autobiography, which was used to promote Lincoln as a possible nominee for the presidency. At the time, the American public did not know very much about Lincoln or his background, and Fell believed that this autobiography would help them to better associate with Lincoln. Lincoln later gave this autobiography to Fell, and it remained in the family along with a personal letter for many years. These papers now, though, reside in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Fell is also credited with instigating the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which put Lincoln into the national political spotlight and aided in leading to his nomination as a presidential candidate in 1860. And Fell also started a newspaper called the Bloomington Daily Pantograph. And Stevenson would work as a reporter and editor for this paper later on between his time at Harvard Law School and Northwestern University Law School. Stevenson's paternal grandfather and namesake, Adelaide Stevenson I, was actually vice president to Grover Cleveland during Cleveland's second term from 1893 to 1897. In the election of 1900, Stevenson ran again as a vice presidential candidate, but this time with William Jennings Bryan. However, they lost to the ticket of William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. And it's interesting to note too that uh, Vice President Stevenson's wife, Letitia Green Stevenson, helped to establish the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, so quite a few notable figures in the family. 
Uh, Stevenson's father, Louis Green Stevenson, was Secretary of State for Illinois from 1914 to 1917. And this tradition of public service continued with Governor Stevenson's eldest son, Adelaide Stevenson III, U.S. Senator from Illinois from 1970 to 1981, and a Democratic candidate for governor in 1982 and 1986. As Governor Stevenson stated, quote, I have a bad case of hereditary politics. And you can see here that that's very true. Uh, Stevenson was very interested in learning about his ancestors and looked to each of these men as role models throughout his life, including Abraham Lincoln. Currently, there are five Adelaide Stevensons, though uh, it has been told to us, uh, maybe jokingly by the family, that Adelaide the fifth is nicknamed Adelaide the last, so we'll see. Um, but with uh, those gentlemen, you can see why Stevenson is actually named Adelaide the second and not a junior because it does skip his father there. Um, though he was born in Los Angeles, Stevenson grew up in Bloomington, Illinois. His family moved back to Illinois from Los Angeles when he was about six years old. And his father had been working as a general manager for the Los Angeles Examiner, which is why they lived there for several years. Both the Jesse Fell and Adelaide Stevenson the first um, sides of the family were from Bloomington. And so there's a long family history from uh, both Stevenson's mother's and father's sides in the Bloomington area. And that's actually where he is buried along with some of these individuals today. So this is just a short resume for Stevenson here to highlight a few of his accomplishments. If you were to put a resume together for Stevenson, it would be too many pages for this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I've looked into doing it. He had numerous roles throughout his career. And so I just want to highlight a few things here. Um, after graduating from Princeton and Northwestern University Law School, Stevenson began his career as a lawyer in Chicago with the firm of Cutting Moore and Sidley. He also held a number of different government staff positions before deciding to enter into politics himself. This included being the youngest president of the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations up to that time. And he also was appointed special assistant to Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox during World War II. Many of these roles helped to define his reputation already uh, around the world and within the United States. Stevenson married a young socialite from Chicago, Ellen Borden, in 1928, and though they divorced by 1949, they had three sons together, Adelaide III, who we mentioned before, Borden, who was named for Ellen's side of the family, and John Fell, who was named for Jesse Fell. Stevenson's decision to enter into politics was in part based on a public opinion poll, which showed that seven out of 10 parents in America didn't want their sons to enter public life. Stevenson commented, boys could suffer and die in their cold, muddy, bloody campaign for the things we believe in, but their parents didn't want their children to work for these same things. I decided then that if I ever had a chance, I would go into public life. Originally, Stevenson wanted to run for the Senate, not for governor, but was prompted to switch by Colonel Jacob M. Arvey, who was chairman of the Cook County Democratic Committee at the time. In 1948, Stevenson ran against incumbent Dwight H. Green and won by the largest majority in Illinois history up to that time. He even carried Illinois by a larger majority than the Democratic candidate for president, Harry S. Truman, that same year carrying Illinois by 572,000 votes to Truman's 34,000 vote lead. This large win, along with the reputation Stevenson developed as governor, led to his emergence in the national political spotlight and in part to his next venture into politics. Stevenson had many achievements during his time as governor, including instilling a sense of public responsibility, shutting down commercial gambling, enforcing fair employment and housing practices, starting a highway improvement program, increasing aid to school districts, and overhauling the state's welfare system. And here you can see some photographs of Stevenson actually at the home here. Um, he's in, in front of the front doors that are still here. We still have the original doors um, during the governor's conference of 1955. And then he's welcoming New York Governor Avril Harriman 
uh, to the house there too. In July of 1952, the Democratic National Convention took place in Chicago, and then Governor Stevenson was asked to give the welcoming address. Unlike the majority of candidates, Stevenson had not sought out the nomination himself, stating that the burdens of the presidential office, quote, stagger the imagination. Regardless of not having sought out the nomination, his speech was so well received that he was nominated right on the convention floor as the candidate. Upon accepting the nomination, Stevenson stated, quote, I have asked the merciful father to let this cup pass from me, but from such dread responsibility, one does not shrink in fear, in self-interest, or in false humility. So if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Stevenson's campaign for president thus began at the convention with no staff and no money at that point. And despite initial reluctance, Stevenson took the challenge on fully. And throughout the 1952 campaign, he consistently demonstrated that he was a politician more concerned with discussing the real issues of the day than in ultimately maybe winning the election. He stated, quote, let's talk sense to the American people. Let's tell them the truth, that there are no gains without pains, that we are now on the eve of great decisions. Stevenson saw the election as a process that would both educate the American public as well as the candidate, reminding the American people that as citizens of this democracy, you are the rulers and the ruled, the law givers and the law abiding, the beginning and the end. He voiced the issues of the day with honesty and conviction, despite the fact that some of his views were unpopular at that time. For example, he spoke against nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s, but he stated, better we lose the election than mislead the people, and better we lose than misgovern the people. In the presidential election of 1952, television had a significant impact on the accessibility of candidates to voters for the very first time. There were roughly 17 million sets in homes across the country, which was a drastic increase compared to the roughly 3,500 sets in homes for the election of 1948. The Republican candidate, Dwight D. Eisenhower, took advantage of this new media outlet by running short television spots, which could be played during popular television shows. These included the famous I Like Ike song and cartoon. And this style was so successful that it set the standard for future political advertisements. Stevenson, on the other hand, did not consider the office of the president to be a commercial commodity requiring advertisement. And he famously responded to the Eisenhower ads stating, quote, what do the Republicans think the White House is, a box of cornflakes? Stevenson adopted a half hour format for his television spots during the campaign of 1952. And these were modeled after President Roosevelt's radio fireside chats. But Stevenson was never really comfortable with television as he thought it limiting and often found himself cut off mid speech despite the half hour. He stated, Quote, sometimes in the deafening clamor of political statesmanship, I've thought that the people might be better served if a party purchased a half hour of radio and television silence during which the audience would be asked to think quietly for themselves. After losing the 1952 election, Stevenson received tens of thousands of letters from around the country and around the world. Though he had lost by a significant margin, winning nine states and losing the electoral college vote 442 to 89, Stevenson rose to fame on a global scale for his wit, ideology, honesty, and conviction. Many historians cite the 1952 election uh, campaign as one of the most defining moments of Stevenson's career. Stevenson wrote of the letters he received, quote, so many of them were from people who voted for the general and evidently felt they owed me an explanation. Curious why people will go to all that trouble to write a long letter when a little X in the right place would have been so much easier. In his concession speech, um, which is actually thought of by many historians as one of the best concession speeches ever given, uh, he had this to say, 
quote, my fellow citizens have made their choice and have selected General Eisenhower and the Republican Party as the instruments of their will for the next four years. The people have rendered their verdict and I gladly accept it. General Eisenhower has been a great leader in war. He has been a vigorous and valiant opponent in the campaign. These qualities will now be dedicated to leading us all through the next four years. It is traditionally American to fight hard before an election. It is equally traditional to close ranks as soon as the people have spoken. From the depths of my heart, I thank all of my party and all of those independents and Republicans who supported Senator Sparkman and me. That which unites us as American citizens is far greater than that which divides us as political parties. I urge you all to give to General Eisenhower the support he will need to carry out the great tasks that lie before him. I pledge him mine. And later on, he went on to state, someone asked me as I came in down on the street how I felt. And I was reminded of a story that a fellow townsman of ours used to tell, Abraham Lincoln. They asked him how he felt once after an unsuccessful election. He said that he felt like a little boy who had stubbed his toe in the dark. He said he was too old to cry, but that it hurt too much to laugh. Stevenson was nominated a second time to run against incumbent President Eisenhower in the election of 1956. And this time Stevenson campaigned more aggressively from the beginning, accusing Eisenhower of being a part-time president who ignored or inadequately handled a number of different issues, ranging from nuclear weapons testing to ending the military draft. And Stevenson's campaign also overhauled its strategy for television advertisements. They used a series of shorter spots called The Man from Libertyville. And these were filmed at his home and modeled after Eisenhower's The Man from Albaline. And at that time, he was the man from Libertyville as Metawa was not incorporated until 1960. Um, Stevenson though maintained his earlier views on television and what was becoming of the presidential election process, stating in his 1956 acceptance speech, the idea that you can merchandise candidates for high office like breakfast cereal, that you can gather votes like box tops, is I think the ultimate indignity to the democratic process. He discussed the role of television further in one of the Man from Libertyville spots, concluding that while television provided him the ability to speak to millions of people, the cost was that he could not listen to them in return. He also stated in that acceptance speech, I say, my friends, what this country needs is not propaganda and a personality cult. What this country needs is leadership and truth, and that is what we mean to give it. Despite his efforts, Stevenson lost by a larger margin this time around, carrying fewer states and still not carrying his home state of Illinois, and still winning under 100 of the 531 electoral votes. Commenting on running against Eisenhower, Stevenson stated, quote, he was glad to even come out second. He had now experienced failure on the national stage twice, but historian Arthur Schlesinger said that through his campaigns, Stevenson, quote, set the tone for a new era of democratic politics, as historians would look back on him as, an, quote, a noble example of the power of positive losing. Many of his ideas would influence future policy and law, such as the eventual halting of hydrogen bomb testing, and he continued to grow and serve as a leader on both the national and world stage. And I just wanted to share a couple more quotes that I think sum him up very well. Um, speaking of his Midwest heritage a little earlier on in his his career, he said, the most important lesson I have ever learned that in quiet places reason abounds that in quiet people there is vision and purpose, that many things are revealed to the humble that are hidden from the great. And one that I think relates to his um, two failed campaigns here as well. He stated at a commencement address at Princeton in 1954, quote, if I could guide you, I could not. What a man knows at 50 that he did not know at 20 is for the most part incommunicable. The knowledge he has acquired with age is not the knowledge of formulas or forms of words, but of people, places, action, a knowledge not gained by words, but by touch, sight, 
sound, victories, failures, sleeplessness, devotion, love. The human experiences and emotions of this earth and of oneself and of other men, and perhaps too, a little faith and reverence for the things you cannot see. And when we talk about historical figures a lot, we talk about their successes, but for Stevenson, he was shaped even more by his failures than by his successes throughout his life and somehow found the strength to overcome each and every one. Um, so he even continues on here with some even more amazing um, career <laughs> experiences. Um, but one other thing to note about the campaigns is that during the campaign of 1952, a very lasting and defining image of Stevenson emerged. And Stevenson was actually on the campaign trail in Flint, Michigan. Um, and I just have to shout out, that's my hometown, <laughs> um, on Labor Day of 1952. And he was at the city's annual Labor Day picnic. And he's seated next to then Governor G. Menning Williams, preparing for a speech he's about to give when a photographer noticed something about Stevenson's shoe. It had a hole in the sole of it, as you can see in this photo. The photographer, William Gallagher of the Flint Journal, was known for his comedic photos and thought this would be a great addition. He quietly set his camera down on the stage, even removed the flash gun and snapped one shot. As soon as he snapped that shot, Stevenson took one look at the photographer and uncrossed his legs. Luckily, Gallagher's photo turned out. Um, and as soon as it went to press the next day, the image was everywhere, from lapel pins to magazines to t-shirts and posters. And this photograph became a famous and enduring image of Stevenson, and also one of the most renowned political photographs in US history. It even went on to win a Pulitzer Prize in 1953, and the original still hangs in the office of the Flint Journal today. What's interesting to note about the photograph is not only the fact that a fairly wealthy man and presidential candidate is walking around with a pair of shoes so worn there is a hole in the sole, but also what he's doing in the photograph. This was taken just a few minutes before he was about to deliver his speech. And most politicians might be out in the crowd or waving to people in the first few rows, shaking hands. But Stevenson here is rewriting his speech. And he often rewrote his speeches up until the very last moment, trying to make them as perfect as possible. He did write quite a few of his speeches. He did have speech writers as well, but even when he had those, he often had a say in what the speech ended up being. <laughs> um, so throughout both campaigns, Stevenson also defined himself as a great orator with his wit and his humor. And I just want to share one more example of these traits as told by his goddaughter, Adele Simmons. In 1952, she was attending a school in Lake Forest where she was the sole supporter of Stevenson. In 1956, she went off to a boarding school on the East Coast and doubled her numbers. She was now one of two supporters of Stevenson at her school, herself and the president of the student government. At her boarding school, she was surrounded by I Like Ike buttons and pins everywhere she turned, and she decided that Stevenson needed to know about this frustrating situation. She wrote a letter to him about her predicament, and in his reply, Stevenson simply sent her a button that read, Adelaide likes me, a little play on I like Ike. Um, and these were around a little bit, but this was not his main campaign slogan, much to my demise, because I would think this would be much more effective um, than some of the ones he did use. And quite a sweet gesture um, to his goddaughter. Well, although Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a close friend and avid supporter, as well as others, wanted Stevenson to run again in the election of 1960, he did not seek out the nomination, stating he would accept if nominated. But this time, however, it, the nomination went to then Senator John F. Kennedy. Stevenson, with his previous experience, desired to be named by President Kennedy as the United States Secretary of State, but was not offered that position. Instead, he accepted the position of United States Ambassador to the United Nations, a role that would end up defining his career in many ways. 
Stevenson had actually played a role in the United Nations since its beginnings. In 1945, he was appointed U.S. Minister and Representative to the Preparatory Commission for the United Nations and served as senior advisor to the U.S. delegation at the first three sessions of the U.N. General Assembly in 1946. In this capacity, he had already won admiration from leaders of other countries for his intelligence and his ability to empathize with other viewpoints. Commenting on what the role of the United Nations should be, Stevenson stated, we should look at the UN as we do other politi political instruments, see what it is not, disabuse ourselves of any illusions, and appreciate how useful it still can be. During his years as the ambassador to the United Nations, Stevenson dealt with a variety of issues and events, including violence in the Congo region of Africa and the war in Vietnam. Prior to his death, he was actually having secret meetings with UN Secretary General U Thant about initiating efforts to end the war almost 10 years before it actually ended in 1974. But his most notable accomplishment while serving as ambassador came during the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which he played a large role through efforts at a UN Security Council meeting, where he famously confronted Soviet Ambassador Valerian Zorin directly about the existence of Soviet missile sites in Cuba. Afterwards, Stevenson stated, quote, let it be remembered not as the day when the world came to the edge of nuclear war but the day when men resolved to let nothing thereafter stop them in their quest for peace. When Stevenson was able, he loved returning to the family farm in what was again then considered Libertyville. It was a refuge for him from his hectic political life and the farm as he affectionately called it was a place where he could come to think, write and reflect. This was the only house he ever owned, and from the time that a house was built on the property until his death, this was the place to which he would always return. He jokingly stated that he had originally wanted to call it Belly Acres, which I kind of like too. Um, for example, you can see here Stevenson um, in a couple pictures here with his wife at the time, Ellen Borden, on the property. Um, in the middle, you can see him walking with caretaker Frank Holland, and we'll talk more about the Holland family in a moment. Um, you can also see that he had quite a few animals in that picture and the one to the right. Um, he had several horses on the property and did uh, have a large sleigh that he would ride around in. The Dalmatians, he had quite a few. They were all named for members of King Arthur's court. So the most famous of the Dalmatians is King Arthur, or Artie, as he was called. And often Artie is the dog that is in pictures you'll see with Stevenson. Um, on that uh, King Arthur theme, his sons even had their own horse that was named Guinevere. And Colonel is actually who you see here in the photo. So at the time, this was a working farm with gardens throughout the property as well. And here we can see some aerial views of the farm. So this is a 1959 um, aerial photograph from the Dunn Museum's collection. And if you can see my cursor, you can see here's St. Mary's Road today. Um, and here's the drive leading up to the house. And here we have the, the house. There was, there's another building on site called the service building. Um, and then back here snaking through is the Desplaines River, which is along the back edge of the property. So today here's a view, helps define some of those a little better as well. Um, Stevenson would take walks around the property. He would ice skate, fish and canoe on the Desplaines River. He also liked to ride the horses that you saw there. Now, when Stevenson originally purchased this site um, and the grounds here, St. Mary's Road did not exist as far south as it does today. And so he is said to have come by canoe with his wife to view the property um, and then purchased 70 acres in 1935 on this site. 
Today we own 40 acres. Uh, 30 acres were sold at the time of his death to neighbors um, in the area. Now the house that I'm sitting in today is actually not the original house either. The first house was even more unique looking than this one. It was uh, viewed in a catalog from Howard Fisher and it was a metal house. So it was covered in steel vertical panels and painted bright yellow, which was Ellen's favorite color. And from the road, it's said to have looked like a big ship in the tall grass prairie surrounding it with its metal railings. Now, unfortunately, shortly after this house was completed and before the Stevensons had fully moved in, the a house caught fire and burned to the ground here, as you can see in this photograph, um, the char marks that are on this house. So they think it started in the basement and eventually engulfed the entire structure, which had to be demolished in the winter of 1937. And Stevenson is said to have returned to the house here, lit his cigar on the burning embers and said, see, we're still using the place. So good attitude, I guess, about that, huh? Um, this house that I'm in today was built on the foundation of the first house and was completed in 1938. So they used a lot of similar styles, but got rid of the metal idea. And here we can see the Holland family. Frank Holland was the caretaker and farm manager of the property from 1937 until 1963. And again, after Stevenson's death from 1965 to 1970. He lived in an apartment in the service building, which is the other building on the site, uh, that also housed the garage, horse stalls, and farm equipment storage, um, but separate from the apartment. And when Stevenson, um, or Stevenson was here, he loved to help Frank Holland uh, with different work around the farm. They had a mutual respect for one another and would often be found walking the grounds and doing uh, different chores and activities together. Now, Frank Holland also lived in the apartment with his wife, Beatrice, and their two children, Carol Ann and Jim. And um, Stevenson really enjoyed eating the fresh fruits and vegetables from his own farm. And when he was governor in Springfield, Mrs. Holland would send him fresh vegetables from the gardens. And apparently his favorite was asparagus. So here in the photos, um, you can see Beatrice and Jim Holland, her son here, on the property in 1958. Um, they're in the bottom picture on the left, they're in the apartment in the service building in 1949. Um, in the center, we've got Frank Holland here at the entrance to one, one entrance to the service building, and there's Artie with Stevenson. Um, they did have sheep on the property too, and Frank Holland did help to care for those sheep. He was an English sheep herder by trade and would maintain the lawn with simply the sheep and a push lawn mower. So for 70 acres, that's a lot. Um, Carol Ann and Jim are both seen together in 1956 at the bottom. And what's really neat for us is that the Holland children grew up here in this area. They went to Libertyville High School and they both still live in Lake County today. So a lot of the photos that you see here and in our collection are actually from Jim Holland. And we can get a lot of information about day-to-day -day activities on the site from them, as well as from the Stevenson uh, sons so, and family, which has been really great to work with both um, families to learn the history of this site. So here's another view of this room that I'm in, the study. And you can see Stevenson at this space um, at the very desk that's behind me today working. And we'll talk more about some of the objects in this room in a little bit. Um, here's just another close-up of some of those objects there from an event we had. And just outside the study is the living room. Um, and this house does have very unique architecture. Um, it's unique not just for the man who lived here, right, but as well as for this. And the firm of Perkins, Wheeler, and Will, uh, Perkins and Will today, uh, actually designed this house and they incorporated several different styles. So there's art deco as well as modern and uh, prairie school. 
made more famous by Frank Lloyd Wright. So here you can see some of that modern. There's no crown molding. Um, there's no mantles above any fireplaces in the home. It's a very um, simplistic and design and everything is very balanced throughout the house, very symmetric. Uh, there's also, as you can see here, some art deco with the curved wall of the fireplace, which is a neat thing to note. And then here we do have some historic photos of rooms in the house. But if you think about your houses too, you don't necessarily go around and take photos of every room in your house. And the Stevensons didn't necessarily either. So we're still looking for some of those historic photos of different rooms. But we do have one of the dining room and of the basement. And it gives you an idea of his decorating style as well. Um, some of these items we don't have in the house today. And here we've got a view of the dining room today with some of our docents going through on a previous tour. Now in the dining room, it's neat if you see on the back wall there, there was a huge mirror and that way guests on either side of this table could see the beautiful landscape that surrounds this house. And the Prairie School architecture adds to that. It incorporates lots of windows, lots of wood, screened in porches and decks. Um, on the home that try to bring the outside in. Corner windows are another feature of that too. Now, one of the most unique rooms in the house is actually the master bathroom. And this is a view of one side of it. Um, again, if you think 1938, this is a pretty modern bathroom for that time, double sinks. Um, all of this room is actually original. We have not replaced any of the hardware or the flooring. And uh, the other side has a very unique feature too. This huge mirror that lights up. And you can see some of the Art Deco again with the curved shelves, the symmetry in the room. So this uh, bathroom actually can hold a group of at least 30 because I've taken them through on tours. So it's also unique for the size of the room too. And here we can see the back of the house. So it has this huge screened in porch off the living room. Stevenson would entertain a lot of famous guests to the home out there with larger events for um, dinner parties in the dining room. You saw it was smaller. There would be smaller events that would be hosted. And uh, personally, I think this is the, one of the prettier views of the house is actually from the back. Now, if you do come to the site, this is a forest preserve, so we'll talk more about that later. But if you do come to the site in April, around April, early May this year too, you'll see these daffodils just covering the entire site. Some are said to have been planted by Stevenson and he received the bulbs as a gift and just tossed them out in the yard and wherever they landed, he planted them, kind of to make them look wild. Um, others were planted later on but they are the one thing the deer don't eat here and um, they, they're beautiful when they bloom. And here again, you can see the front of the house. So a lot of the simplicity of design, the very symmetric features, you can see that here too. Um, some of the prairie school with the corner windows and the roof line as well. Well, while serving as ambassador to the UN in London, Adelaide Stevenson suffered a heart attack and passed away on July 14th of 1965. He was only 65 years old. But to this day, he remains an important historical figure and relevant because his words and ideas have left such a lasting legacy. He was a great observer of his time and many of the issues that concerned him over 50 years ago still concern us today. As the poet Archibald MacLeish stated, quote, his great achievement was not political triumph or indeed triumph of any kind. His great achievement was the enrichment of his time by the nature of his relationships with his time. The New York Times also wrote upon his death to the public dialogue of his time, he brought intelligence, civility, and grace. We who have been his contemporaries have been companions of greatness. And I think one of his um, 
colleagues and friends summed up his legacy very nicely too by stating, quote, his life's work was to serve not only his country, but all mankind in everything he said and did. And Adelaide Stevenson expressed the deepest aspirations of everyone who believes we are capable of building a safer and saner world. And I'll end uh, the, the presentation part today with Stevenson's own words. In a speech from 1954 at the senior class banquet of his alma mater of Princeton. And he says, your days are short here and now in the serenity and quiet of this lovely place, touch the depths of truth, feel the hem of heaven. You will go away with old good friends and don't forget when you leave why you came. And I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but we can stop sharing my screen here. And um, you can see the view of the study a little better. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer some of those, but I'm also happy to talk more about the space that I'm in and point out some of the artifacts, so. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we, we, well, there's one question. Let's just start with one question that's already um, waiting for you. Um, sure. The question is, who sold 30 of the 70 acres at the time of his death and why? Sure. So when he passed away in 1965, um, his sons decided to sell the property to family friends. And when um, they, they sold the property, they sold 40 acres and the buildings that were on the site to um, the family friends, Jane and Edison Dick um, of the AB Dick Company. And uh, 30 acres were then sold to the neighbors next door. And the sons in part decided to sell it, I think, to family friends because they all had their own homes. Um, not all of them were still in the area. Only today, Senator Stevenson actually still lives in the area. So um, we, we see him more frequently. Um, but yeah. And, and someone would like to know if you can recommend a book that would include many of these quotes because this person really likes the quotes. Is there, is there a, comp a compilation of his quotes? There are many. <laughs> so okay. um, I have lots of book recommendations if anyone would like those. But um, to highlight a few, so when he was alive, some of his speeches were actually turned into books. So he wrote the foreword and the conclusion for some of those. Uh, you can often find those at books, uh, older bookstores, but um, even at your local libraries, I bet they have some. Uh, one of the best, though, for strictly quotes is called The Wit and Wisdom of Adelaide Stevenson, and it's just short quotes, the whole book. So <laughs> that's a great one to start with if you would like an introduction to Stevenson as well. Great. Um, let's see, there's a question here. Um, oh, so... Please tell us how to visit the site, you know, at once things return to normal. Sure. So even at this time, this is a forest preserve site and you are able to walk the grounds and visit the property itself. There are outdoor exhibit display panels that talk about him and his career as well as the home. So you could view those. You can also, if you're ambitious, um, I think it's a little better in winter with uh, the the path back, but you can walk down to the Des Plaines River. Uh, you can also walk to an original tennis court that's still on the site. Um, Stevenson said to have played with his sons and he often beat them with his wit. So <laughs> quite competitive there with his sons there in tennis. Um, but you can walk these grounds any day. They're open from 6 a.m. until sunset. And there's a fairly large parking lot that you will find at the end of the driveway up. Um, the house itself, we will keep you posted. If you'd like to look on our website or on our social media, you can follow us. Um, hopefully in the future, we will uh, be able to open this back up for, for tours again um, sometime this year, but uh, we'll keep you posted uh, on that. So. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have a question. Someone would like to know, can you tell us more about the famous visit by Nikita Khrushchev? Oh. Um, a little bit, <laughs> yes. Uh, Stevenson is said to have met with him um, and a couple times. Um, Stevenson went on several larger trips around the world, and on some of those he did interact with him too, but um, I, I don't know a ton about his interactions 
in this area when he came to the United States. So sorry about that, but I'll have to look that up too. <laughs> There's so much to know about Stevenson. I feel like I, you know, even after working here for almost 13 years, I still feel like um, there's a lot more to learn always. So you, Can you tell us about some of the that. artifacts that's behind you? Sure. Yeah. So just to point out some of the main ones, um, you can see his desk here behind me. This is his actual desk. Um, he is said to have taken the laundry table from the basement at one point and thought that was a suitable desk. So that's why it might not look like your typical desk with drawers. Um, you can see though he has a lot of storage in here for book shelves as well as there's drawers all around the room. Um, but to point out a couple of the main ones, we've got his nameplate on the desk that you can see there. Um, the chair behind the desk is actually his cabinet chair when he was ambassador to the United Nations. So upon accepting that position from President Kennedy, he insisted it be made part of the presidential cabinet because it was not previously. So there's a plaque on the back that actually designates it as the first chair for that position within the cabinet. And he would have sat there for all those different cabinet meetings. Um, another neat one, which I'll, I'll grab here too and bring it a little closer. I'm gonna grab my gloves. Um, we'll put those on. So on the note of guests to the home, um, we actually have his Rolodex. So this is a really neat piece. Lots of famous names within this. Um, this page is actually open to B. And one of my favorites in there right here is Betty Bacall. Um, so if that sounds familiar, that's because that's Lauren Bacall, the actress, but he called her Betty. And she was friends with him and did visit the home. Um, also in here is Eleanor Roosevelt, um, Jackie Kennedy, Harry Truman's in here. Um, John Steinbeck as well, who was a, a fan and did um, visit the home at one point too. Uh, and as well as just a number for the White House. So supposedly that number might still work, but we have not tried it ourselves. <laughs> um, so that's a neat one there. If there's other things that stand out to you, let me know, but I'll, I'll bring out a couple more. Um, we did receive uh, some items from his childhood home. And in one of them was this item here, which is a tie pin. And it's an optical illusion, which is fun. Um, and on a tour, I had a gentleman say I needed a bigger one. So he gave me this one, <laughs> although donated it to the museum all the way with Adlai, which was his main campaign slogan. But um, when the students come through, we like to joke that this is high tech. So. <laughs> Um, we also have some other neat pieces in here. Um, one of the smallest that I like to point out is this little book. And this is actually a book from his funeral. And his sister, Buffy, is said to have noticed that he had several of these books in a jewelry box um, and thought he might like his own for the funeral. But here's this is her copy. So that's her, her card there. Her name was Elizabeth, but they called her Buffy. Um, and she, she put these together, but it's a little remembrance book, kind of the idea of a prayer card, but in book form. So you can see a photo of him, his birth and death dates, and then inside are Psalms, but also the eulogies that were given by President Johnson, as well as the governor of Illinois at the time and the, head, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations at the time. So it's a really neat little keepsake, um, but I survey guests to the home to see if anyone's seen these before. And so far, no, um, nobody's seen those used before. So if there's some other questions about certain items, I'm happy to answer those. One other I'll point out for now is we actually do have a shoe of his. Um, and these are a unique pair. They're said to have been given to him as a gift when he toured 50 countries, uh, or th excuse me, 30 countries in five months in 1953 for Look Magazine. And he was um, asked to do that by Look Magazine to write articles 
about the social and political situations in each country. And it's quite an astounding trip when you think about it um, in many different ways, but he accomplished that trip. And these shoes are apparently a gift um, while he was on it. So pretty neat piece for us to have. One other more unique item that I like to point out is he was actually given the key to Anchorage, Alaska. And he uh, made a trip up there in 1954. Alaska was not a state either time he ran for the presidency, but he campaigned for Alaska to be made part of the United States. And this plaque um, designates his trip. And whenever I have um, students come through too, they think this looks like a Nestle Crunch Bar. And I can't not think that when I look at this key now. <laughs> Um, any other questions about artifacts in the room, Roz, or about Stevenson? We do, we, we do have some more questions. Sure. Um, someone would like to know, how did the Forest Preserve come to own the property? Sure. So I mentioned uh, Jane and Edison Dick before, and they were family friends. Um, and Jane Dick also was chair of Volunteers for Stevenson when he was running, served in a couple different roles with him at the United Nations. Um, but they actually purchased the home from the Stevenson family, lived here for a couple years, and then in 1974, they donated the grounds and the buildings to the Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, it uh, remained in our control and we uh, finally were able to get some grant funding to preserve and restore the home in 2000. And then in 2008, we actually opened to the public for tours. Okay. And does anyone know where the name Adlai came from? Yes. Um, so supposedly, I've not figured out exactly where, but supposedly it's a biblical name. So mm -hmm. they actually took it out of the Bible. Um, and behind me on the desk, there is a rather large, if I move this item. There is a rather large family Bible back there. Um, but yes, that's where it's said to have come from. And uh, throughout the campaigns, he had a lot of people pronounce it in different ways. So ad lay, ad lie. Um, we've been told it's ad lay. Okay. And um, he, and even one of the ads um, stated, I, I don't care how you say it, just go out and vote it. So. Right. It's why I went to Adlai Stevenson Elementary School, which is in Michigan. And so mm -hmm. now my kids went to Adlai Stevenson you know, High School, you know, here. And it's just kind of such a weird coincidence. I have no idea why my elementary school was named after him or what connection he might have to the Detroit area. But yeah, I, I have heard of that school, too. And I haven't looked into it, but um, to figure out exactly why they named a school for him there. But the high school here was named for him and just happened to coincide um, with finishing the high school about the time that he passed away. So they decided to name it for him. Um, someone would like to know, what is the large framed object in the bookcase? I think it's that large, yeah. Um. Yes, so we actually have a couple items today on loan from the family that have to do with his grandfather, who was vice president, um, Adelaide the first. And that is actually a campaign banner. Um, next to it is a pin. And uh, we have a, another piece over on the side here that's a, a flag. And those are all from when they were campaigning um, for the presidency and vice presidency. So it might not have been here at the time that Stevenson lived at this house, but he did have some family antiques and memorabilia. And you saw more of that in the room um, which I forgot to explain, in the basement, there was two photos, the dining room and the basement. Um, the basement was kind of like another um, family room and he had a lot of those pieces down there. And someone would like to know why someone hasn't tried the White House phone number up to this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does just list an extension. So I'm not sure how you would dial that today. Yeah. Um, if you think too, you know, at the time with how phones worked it's it's really interesting to think so um in the house stevenson did not originally even have a telephone in the study 
He had a telephone over off the main entrance of the house, kind of tucked in a corner with a phone table and chair. And that was more traditional at that time. But when you go through that little tight corner, you know, thinking of the important phone calls he would have re received over there um, is interesting to note. But in the Rolodex, um, the numbers are not listed like they would be today. Um, so I don't know that it's it like would different work. different exchanges. <laughs> they weren't like the same area codes and things like that, right? Different. No, and they're just a few numbers. It's not the seven digits that we're used to seeing. Um, let's see, another question. Was he friends with Gore Vidal? Do you know? That, I actually don't know that. Um, I'll have to look into that too. He is okay. not in the phone book, so <laughs> <laughs> I do good. know that. Well, um, I think we answered everybody's questions. And, you know, I just really, um, I thought this was a really wonderful program and just so interesting to hear about someone that, you know, again, if you live in this area and you hear the name constantly, but just to know the person behind it and, you know, having just gone through the election and the inauguration, his comments just seem um, just so relevant. Like you think, you know, they seem really, even though he was talking, he was in the 50s, but he was talking about as relevant what we're going through now. And we think what we're going through now is unique, but, you know, a lot of it was just kind of the same feelings and the same issues. So it was really kind of, I think, um, comforting to hear his words because he was such a great speaker and chose his words so carefully. Yes, he really was um, a really great speaker. And um, it's, it's neat to hear his own words too. Um, and so I'll have to uh, send, but you can find it on our social media too, is a link to an introductory video that we usually show on tours of the home and you can actually hear him speaking. Mm. And you could even look up some of those videos on YouTube. Um, you can actually find his speech at the uh, Security Council meeting um, about the Cuban Missile Crisis as well as some others. So if you'd like to hear his words, that's another way to do it. But yeah, he every time I research, you know, him or look into um, his writings, it's astounding how much it could be applied to today. And historians and others um, have said, you know, he was he was a bit ahead of his time, um, which is maybe why he lost so largely in both presidential campaigns. But he really did influence in many ways future um, presidents and future policies that were actually carried out. So it's really neat to see that the impact that he did have, but also hopefully to, to give him a little elevation today because he's not always given his credit necessarily or as well known as he was during his lifetime. Um, and a lot of what he said then does does fit today too. So it's always interesting to see that. Yeah. Well, good. Well, um, Nicole, I hope you know those were some really nice comments in the chat. So take a look at those. Oh, nice. And um, just thank you again for joining us. It's always a pleasure to to host one of your presentations. Um, thank and you. thank you to everyone <laughs> who joined us tonight. And um, we will have a recording made of this, so you'll get a link of it so you can share it with your friends or family who might well, you know, missed out or you think would find it interesting. And we hope to see you soon again at the library here online. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Roz.